Okay. So welcome everybody to uh, the latest session of the EDAM Astrophysical Colloquium here at Graz University. Um, it's my pleasure to, to welcome our speaker today, Aldo Serenelli, Professor Aldo Serenelli from the ICE in Barcelona. And he will be speaking today about solar modeling, the, the achievements and the, and the challenges with it. Aldo did his PhD in 2002 on white dwarf evolution in Argentina. Then he moved to the Max Planck in Daching, from where he changed back to Princeton, to come back to Daching after five years, and in 2010 started at the ICE in Barcelona as a Ramon Hall Fellow. In the meantime, he's a tenured researcher and is well known for his work on astroparticle physics, as well as masses and modeling. The, the, today's talk is actually a substitute. We originally, um, in 2019, uh, Aldo invited me to give a talk in Barcelona and uh, we departed saying, you come to Graz to give a seminar here and, and Aldo said, yes, but please schedule it in winter because I want to go skiing. Apologies, um, 2020 had different plans for us, but I hope that we can, um, can uh, catch up on that somewhere in the near future. With this, I yield the floor to Aldo and ask for your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, very good. Okay, so thanks, uh, Paul, for the invitation and for the presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, the talk today will be uh, related 90% uh, to, to, to solar uh, models uh, and uh, related topics of heliosismology and uh, solar neutrinos. Um, I apologize in advance for those following the field because uh, they, they will not find uh, many new results, but I think uh, it will be a, hopefully a, a, an interesting uh, overview of the, of the current status and the, the challenges, as, as Paul was saying, that, that uh, lie still on the field. And I have tried to structure, oops, here, okay. I have tried to, to structure the, the talk in, uh, oh, sorry, in, in three parts. The first part I will try to, to, to give you a, an idea of uh, what I call the, the coherent picture, which does not necessarily mean it's correct. Coherent in the sense that uh, uh, results are consistent with each other, um, and this will involve uh, uh, solar models, uh, abundances, heliosismology, and neutrinos. But then when we will go in the second part a bit deeper into some of these issues, uh, we will see that this uh, coherence is uh, somehow uh, lost. And this will involve um, more or less recent work uh, that has been done on opacities, uh, also on seismology, uh, and also in spectroscopy. Um, finally, I will try to, to, to all give a, a brief overview of the situation uh, for astroseismology that derives from the problems we are facing uh, when, when modeling the sun. So, um, the type of solar models I will, I will be referring to in, in this talk are standard solar models. Uh, and by this, uh, what we mean is that uh, the number of free parameters in the models uh, we try to keep uh, at the minimum. That implies that some physical processes uh, like could be mixing below the taco line uh, or uh, transport of um, uh, angular momentum they are not taken into account uh, because you need to uh, adjust 
uh, parameters to, 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 to account for these effects in, in the models. And we try to avoid in this, uh, in here, this, this kind of complication, this, because it requires a lot of phenomenology. Uh, and so some, in some way, the predictive power of, of the models is partially lost. So here, the, 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 the idea is very simple. Most of you know this. So we know the present day luminosity radius uh, of the sun. Uh, we need to fix the surface uh, composition because it's what we can observe through spectroscopy and okay, meteoritic abundances or some other things, but let's say mostly through spectroscopy. Uh, and the fact that we know the solar system age and we know the solar mass, which we assume constant, leaves us with three uh, parameters to fix. Uh, which are the uh, solar luminosity, the solar radius, and the surface uh, metal to hydrogen abundance uh, ratio. And then we need three free parameters to do this, which we usually take as a mixing length parameter to deal with convection, and two parameters, initial metallicity and, and helium abundance, to deal with the composition, uh, the, the initial composition of the, of the model. And we play with these three parameters until we are able to fix the solar radius, solar uh, surface, the metals, and luminosity. So all the models I will be talking about are built in this way, okay? where uh, the differences will be, uh, for example, what you can see here on the, on the last row of the, of the table is the surface metal to hydrogen abundance ratio, or some changes in the uh, microscopic physics in the models. Uh, and in this talk today, the, the differences will come only from the type of radiative opacities that are included in the in the model. Okay. Otherwise, the the structure, the the, the, the framework, let's say, is is fixed by by these conditions. Okay. Oops. This. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how to. Somehow. Sorry. Okay. Here. Okay, so um, the new challenges, uh, which are not so new anymore, are uh, uh, showing up in, in helioseismic uh, results. And they have been triggered by the, say, revolution that has happened in, in spectroscopic uh, analysis, starting maybe 15, 15 years ago, uh, with the introduction of uh, uh, 3D models for uh, envelope uh, convection of the sun or solar like stars. So this has uh, uh, produced a new set of uh, spectroscopic abundances combined with uh, uh, modeling of uh, non-LT non uh, line formation uh, and improvements in atomic data. And so so uh, this has uh, led to uh, the new determinations of solar abundances, which uh, have started uh, coming in 2005 as a sort of a compilation, but continue to be improved or, or updated. Uh, over the years. And the basic uh, uh, idea behind the, the necessity of using 3D models, you can see on the on the right panel here, because you see the, the temperature stratification as a function of, of depth in a kind of a, a histogram here, where the, the darker the color is, the more often that the given temperature is realized at the given, at the given depth. Uh, and you see that the uh, the structure cannot be reproduced really by, by 1D model, right? And you have some average shown there, for example, as a solid black line. But you see, for example, that at certain depths, there's really um, not just a dispersion, but even almost like a, a multi value function. So I should have forgotten here this, this figure was provided by, by Satsral Magic. Uh, okay. So uh, this, this combination led to these revisions of, of solar abundances that I guess most, most of you are, are aware of. And this is, I'm, I'm summarizing here in this plot. In blue, this is the old generation of, of abundances based on this 1D uh, models and LTE analysis. And there you have in, in red and in gray, uh, a result from the more modern uh, type of analysis. This is all uh, for different elements, normalized to one with respect to the old uh, abundances, so the blue ones. And the, the main message here is that the reduction 
uh, that has occurred by the new generation of, of analysis uh, is mostly uh, related to the ref um, to the CNO elements, to the volatile elements. Okay, you can see in carbon, nitrogen, and particularly oxygen uh, have been reduced by uh, 20, 30 percent or so. Yeah, uh, the case of neon is, is an additional spe special case because it's not observed in the in the spectrum, so it's derived by indirect means from solar wind measurements or um, chromos uh, corona analysis and. So it's mostly attached to, to oxygen. Okay. Now this reduction comes partly because of the three defects, partly because of the atomic data and the non-LT treatment and discovery of some hidden blends, in particular for oxygen. Um, but you see also that there are some differences between the red and the gray, which, uh, which are both new generations, but uh, also results are not uh, necessarily consistent between the, the new numbers. Okay. But, okay, so with this in hand, uh, of course, uh, this uh, solar abundances act as a boundary condition for the solar model. And when uh, uh, you play uh, with the old abundances or high metallicity, which is what you can see here in blue, or the red, and you do your solar model calibrations, and then you look at the sound speed profiles, you end up with the results that uh, are, are shown here. So here on the y-axis, you see the fractional difference between the sound speed uh, in the model and the sun. Okay, this is obtained through uh, inversion of helioseismic data. Okay, and so and in the, the shaded regions are the errors uh, estimated from the solar models themselves. So varying the initial composition, varying the nuclear reaction rates, varying uh, the diffusion rates, all the physics that goes into the solar models. This is the pink area, and in, 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 in light blue are the errors associated with the inversion of the frequency, so the inversion uh, techniques. And so here, uh, clearly you can see that the, the low metallicity uh, um, abundances uh, lead to solar models which are in worse agreement uh, with the data, even taking into account uh, the, all these errors. Uh, than the old metallicity. So this has been around for, for many years already. Uh, depending on who you talk to, it would be classified as the solar abundance problem. Some people don't like this. They say it's a solar uh, model problem. So that's okay. Regardless what the name you want to put, uh, this is a problem. Because the very nice agreement that uh, was there with the old composition when you use this very fancy uh, spectroscopic uh, analysis, uh, it's, it's degraded by substantially. Right? And so the question is then whether the problem lies in the abundances or in how we are modeling the, the solar interior. Okay. And of course, whatever we do wrong for the sun, we do wrong for all other stars. So this is a, um, Equivalent plot, but showing the inversion of the density profile, which is other other quantity you can get from from heliocentric inversions, and again you see much larger differences with the low metallicity uh, models shown in in red here. Okay. This is fractional difference, of course, the very large fractional difference in the envelope uh, that you see here is associated with the fact that you have uh, to compensate such that the uh, integral of the density give you the solar mass. So when you have, uh, you have to compensate the differences. And of course, the outer layer density is low. So it's easier in a sense to, to have larger uh, fractional variation. And there are other pros of the, uh, the you can apply with helioseismology. And one is to the termination of the surface helium abundance. Uh, the other one is the depth of the convective envelope that the sun has. So this is highlighted in this table below for the high metallicity model in the, in the first column, the low metallicity in the middle, and the solar values, which are those inferred from heliosismic analysis uh, on the right column. And again, you can uh, uh, take a look at the numbers, but uh, roughly uh, the disagreement with the low metallicity is uh, of the order of three or sigma, depending on how you count this. And then uh, on the other hand, with the high metallicity, it's within one sigma. Typically, so the, the problem is there, right? So the, with the low metallicity, the convective envelope is too shallow, 
and the surface helium is too low compared to, to the data. So uh, there are additional probes uh, that one can use on HEOPS, okay? Heliosismology, okay? But for this, I, 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 I just make a, a brief uh, comment on, on, on frequencies themselves. So instead of now looking at the result of uh, a lot of analysis in inversions, we just look at the frequencies. So these are frequencies uh, of the sun as a star. So these are, you, these are low degree uh, frequencies. It's the same type of frequencies you would observe with astroseismology, so in other stars, okay? And in the case of the sun, like all main sequence stars uh, of, solar, uh, of solar type, uh, these are acoustic modes. And the acoustic modes in the asymptotic limit, so when, you, when your radial order is above 10 or so, behave more or less uh, in a quite a regular pattern, where each frequency, as you can see in the expression on the left, uh, is given by the radial order n plus the angular degree l divided 2 times a quantity, which we call the large frequency separation, which is roughly constant, plus some uh, uh, additional uh, second order, let's put it this way, okay, which is the, the, the quantity that is in, in square. If you look at the expression n plus l over 2, you realize that if you change n and l by proper amount, and you take the difference of those frequencies, you can eliminate the first term in this expression and you are left only with the part that is expressed here in the, in the square, okay? And in this asymptotic limit, this coefficient a has the expression that is written there as the integral of the gradient of the sound speed uh, integrated with one over r, so weighted towards the center uh, and integrated over the whole side. And this, this quantity in square here is called the small frequency separation, and this is what is illustrated here uh, with, the, with the arrows. Right? And you can compute it using uh, radial orders of L equals zero uh, with quadrupole, L equals two, which is the, the, the separation you see on the left, and then on the right using uh, dipole and octopole modes. Okay. So this is a, a very interesting uh, probe because as you can see from this integral, you will be weighting the measure uh, towards the center of the star because the weight is one over r. Okay, so the, the gradient of the sound speed will contribute more in the center of the star than in the outer layers. Uh, and in fact, uh, yeah. you can see that the uh, on, on on the figure here where it's illustrated the the integrand of the of the of the quantity a that for different solar models that you have see here with different compositions, quite different compositions, in fact, this, this quantity is pretty much the same in all the star, except really very close uh, to the center. Okay. It means that if you measure this, this small frequency separations, you will be sensitive to, to what's happening in the core of the star and not what's happening outside. Okay. So this has been uh, known for a long time, has been used in, in several cases, uh, and in fact, an improved way of, of zooming into the solar core is to use not just the small frequency separation, but use the frequency separation uh, ratio that are illustrated in this, in this box here. Okay. So um, regardless of the details, the, the bottom line here, the, the message here to keep in mind is that when you use the, this frequency uh, ratio or this uh, frequency difference ratio, uh, you will be uh, zooming uh, uh, into the into the solar core and not what's happening outside. So, with this in mind, this uh, a comparison now of the frequency separation ratios computed for the sun uh, against the the model. And here again, you see that the blue uh, the blue line uh, corresponds to the high metallicity models, and the red to the low metallicity models. And so, you have a much nicer agreement. With, again, with high metallicity than with low, and you can see the residuals on the on the bottom panel. Okay. So again, the the low uh, frequency, the low metallicity models show discrepancy with respect to helioseismic results. Okay. So we have now also uh, some idea that the core structure predicted by solar models with low set is not 
is not proper, not correct. Now, let me pile uh, up a, a little bit more uh, information, uh, going quickly into solar, uh, into the neutrinos. Uh, okay, so this is the PP chain, all the different three chains that uh, produce helium, uh, starting from, from hydrogen, and highlighted there, you have the reactions that produce um, uh, neutrinos. Are, there are five of them. One is completely marginal, the one that you see on the right, which is HEP, HEP. This, doesn't count at all in terms of the, the energetics of the sun. Uh, the other four are relevant uh, in the energetics of the sun or because in particular the case of boron and neutrino is the one one uh, that can be measured uh, best with the solar neutrino experiment. Okay. So now we have this uh, additional uh, piece of information. Now this is the solar neutrino spectrum, theoretical. So you have the uh, the fluxes uh, the, the neutrinos have coming from each of these reactions has a specific uh, energy spectrum that is, is shown here, okay? And you see on top just schematically which energy range is covered by the different type of uh, uh, neutrino spectrum, okay? So to make this uh, very short, when you take all the available data, so Homestake was the original Florian experiment, plus the gallium experiments, plus the uh, water uh, Cherenkov experiments, Kamikanda, Super K, Snow, and Borexino. You put all these together, you analyze all this uh, information, you take into account the neutrino oscillations and everything and so on. And the state of the art right now is that the boronate flux can be measured to 2%, beryllium 7 to 3.5% uh, or so, and then the PP and PP to around 10%. So this information we also have. In particular, boron 8, as you can see, and, and beryllium 7 are measured uh, uh, very well. So when we compare now these uh, neutrino results with the solar models, okay, you see here on the left, in particular, on the x-axis, this is a beryllium 7 neutrino flux, normalized to the experimental value, which is then in located at one, and you see the, the, the cross there is the, the experimental result. Okay, and you see the uh, ellipses there showing the result from the two solar models. Okay. Now the ellipses is because here we are showing the results uh, including all the model uncertainties. Okay. Now, um, the interesting thing here is that you see this line this that crosses in diagonal this plot, which is called TC, and this is basically telling you how these neutrinos, so beryllium-7 against boronate, could change if you would be able to change the central temperature in your model, in the sun, okay? And you see that the, the two solar models align very well along this line, okay? Now, to make this more, more obvious, uh, if we forget about the uncertainties coming from nuclear reactions and we keep only the uncertainties coming from what we call environmental factors. So everything that affects the central temperature, you see that the correlation uh, between the uh, error ellipses and the behavior of the central temperature is almost one-to-one, -one. it's almost perfect, right? It means that uh, the only difference between the high metallicity and the low metallicity models regarding the PP uh, chain neutrinos it's just the temperature of the sun. There's not really info direct information on the composition, but it's just that indirectly composition is affecting the core temperature, okay? At the same time, <laughs> you see the unfortunate uh, result that the experimental value is almost halfway between the two, the two solar uh, models, okay? But uh, the bottom line here is that the neutrinos coming from the PP chains, in fact, determine the temperature or indirectly the effective opacity that you have in the solar uh, in the solar core where the neutrinos are produced, okay? So they are only indirectly related to composition, okay? So this is something to, to keep in mind. And so the effect of metals as uh, anticipated uh, in the structure of the sun is mostly done through the impact on the opacity. And the opacity determines 
the radiative gradient you will have in the sun. And here you have three uh, different panels. The left corresponds to the solar center, the middle one to 40% uh, uh, from uh, in radius coming from the center, to the, and the right hand panel corresponds to the location right below the convective envelope. Okay. So you have there the condition, the temperature, density, and you have the different uh, contributions of elements to the total opacity in those cases. Okay. and the different uh, atom processes, so electron scattering, free free, bound free, and bound bound. Okay. And so here you can see that uh, oxygen and neon contribute a lot to the opacity below the convective zone, iron as well. Okay. So clearly, when you change the metallicity, you are changing the opacity, and this is producing all these problems uh, in, the, in the solar models. Okay. So um, one can then transform this uh, change in metallicity to a change in the opacity. So you can, uh, let's say, try to um, create an opacity variation that would recover the seismic results and eventually the solar neutrino results. And what you find is that you need a variation which is around uh, 20, 25% at the base of the convective zone, which is located here at 0 0.7. And a few percent, you can go down to 5% or so towards the solar core. The important thing is that you need this variation to be uh, tilted in this way. So you need it to be lower at the core and larger at the envelope in order to fix the sound speed. And in terms of the solar neutrinos or the surface helium abundance, this sets the zero point of the correction at the solar core. Okay. So with this complementary information coming from neutrinos and, and helioseismology, you can adjust, or you can, let's say, um, find out how is this opacity variation that you need to, to impose to, to recover the agreement. And you can do something a bit fancier with some Gaussian process to, to try to understand the shape of this variation a bit better. But the, for, for what we care about here, the results are, are more or less uh, always uh, the same, regardless of the method you, you try to look for. So you need a, something like a 20% variation at the base of the convective zone and a small variation towards the, towards the solar core. This has been done by, by several people. So this is paper from, from Song. The, the previous one was from Vilante 2014, but this has also been looked at by, by Christian Sendarsgaard, by, by uh, other people doing different different method. But the bottom line is that if you trust the new abundances, which are not new anymore, but the low abundances, the low metallicity abundances, you need to compensate by this among the, the opacity. Okay. But so far we have what I would call a coherent picture. So the high metallicity models yield consistently good results for seismology. The low metallicity models yield consistently worse or bad results. We know the solar neutrinos are sensitive to temperature, but that's it. We don't have a, a detailed uh, determination of, of composition through them. Okay. And in fact, all this result would show is that the metallicity and the opacity are almost completely degenerate. So we cannot disentangle from that data one effect or the other. Okay. And therefore, if we change the opacity, we are able to compensate this metallicity. So this we know uh, pretty well. Okay. So the question then moves into the realm of uh, opacities, at least uh, in, in this talk. The big problem we have with opacities in stellar physics in general is that the conditions of high temperature and density that happen in the stellar interiors are almost uh, impossible to meet in experimental setups uh, on Earth. Okay. So uh, everything regarding uh, atomic opacities for stellar interiors relies on theoretical calculation, okay? Now, uh, about 10 years ago now, the first uh, experiment um, very close to the conditions that happen in the sun, right below the convective zone, were carried out in the, in the, in the Sandia lab in the US, uh, where they measured for the first time uh, uh, iron opacity directly. 
the paper was, pub was published a few years after the measurements were taken, so in 2015. Okay, and uh, this is a very important result because, as I said, it's the, really the, the first experimental result we have on this on this condition. Okay. Now, it's not just important because of this, but also because it created a lot of uh, headaches uh, for people doing theoretical calculations. So here. What you see, and just focus right now on the on the first on the first panel, the black uh, curve is the measured monochromatic opacity for iron. This is pure iron, okay? So there's no solar mixture or anything like that. So this is pure iron. And you see uh, the measurement in black. From time to time, you see like, where it says data, there is a few error bars to give you an idea of the, of the uncertainty of the, of the measurement. And in, 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 the, in light blue, what you have there is the comparison with a monochromatic opacity coming from one of the most widely used uh, uh, opacity calculations uh, in stellar physics, which is the OP, the Opacity Project Compile. And you see that the comparison is terrible, <laughs> basically. Uh, you don't need to worry so much about the peaks because the, where the opacity is high, the photons don't go through, but photons go through where the opacity is low. And you see, for example, on the, oh, oh, sorry, here, you see here uh, on the left part, so below 10 angstroms, where is this quasi-continuum, that the data is much higher than, than the model, okay? But if you go to the middle panel, you see that it's not a feature of OP, but all other theoretical calculations, which are this atomic, opas, and scope, they all have the same problem there. They are all underestimating uh, the, this quasi-continuum here. Okay, so there are other problems. So one is the lower quasi-continuum. The lines in the models are also narrower than the, what the data shows, okay? And also these uh, opacity windows that you can see here, for example, between 11.5 and 12 angstrom, they are also much lower in the, in the models than in the data. So that means basically that the model, if the experiment is correct, are underestimating the, the opacity by a lot, okay? And this, as I said, it's a common feature with all the atomic uh, models, okay? And so this is a, a nice hint that maybe atomic calculations are uh, wrong and are wrong in the direction that would help solve this problem because this would imply that opacities are larger than the current estimates we have from the, from the calculation. If you put these together, the uh, iron Roseland mean uh, is seems to be uh, un underestimated by 40% or so in the calculations. And when you combine this with all the other elements to make a solar mixture, so where you put not just iron, but uh, oxygen, uh, silicon, et cetera, et cetera, the opacity seems uh, increases about 7% in total, which is less than what is needed, but at least shows that you know, it's it's possible that uh, theory is not doing the the job uh, as we would like. To. Okay. There's also the possibility that the experiment itself is not uh, free from from systematic problems. Okay. So the same group has uh, carried on with a, a couple of uh, other elements, in particular chromium and nickel. They took chromium and nickel not because they are particularly relevant for solar interior models particular chromium is very underabundant, but because they allow them to test uh, um, physical conditions, which could give some idea of whether the experiment with iron was right or wrong. In particular, iron in the conditions that they measured is an, has an open L-shell structure, and chromium also has an open L-shell structure. So this allows them to study for systematics, whereas nickel uh, is a closed shell. So it gives them uh, sensitivity to, to other uh, effects. And the results they have obtained is that the narrow lines are present in all cases, uh, in the sense that the models are always narrower than the experiment. So this clearly seems to be a problem in the atomic calculation. The deeper opacity windows are only present in iron and chromium, not in nickel. So that also gives the idea that something is wrong with the atomic calculations in that particular atomic configuration. 
Okay, so that gives an idea to, to, to theories uh, on where to, to work. Okay. On the other hand, this pseudo continuum uh, problem that you see with iron is not observed neither for chromium, neither for nickel, not for chromium, neither for nickel. Okay. Now, there is a caveat here that these experiments were done at lower temperatures than the iron experiment in order to have the uh, L shell, open L shell, and closed L shell. Okay. And so it's not clear whether there is something missing in the atomic calculations here, or there is some experimental problem that is sneaking in only at higher temperatures. In particular, the, the, the boundary is about 180 electron volt, which is almost too, close to 2 million Kelvin. Right? So this, the, this, this part remains a bit open. Okay. On the other hand, they repeated the experiment with different samples, different thickness. Different, so they tried to, to test whether there was some systematic there and nothing was, was found in the, in the experiment. So that remains a bit open, but at least there is a very nice uh, push uh, in, in some clear direction from experiments towards the, the theory. Okay. On the other hand, as I said, we still need to rely on for many years, uh, we will need to rely completely on theoretical calculations. And uh, we also have here two different generations, if you want. We have on one hand the traditional calculations, which are OPAL uh, and OP. Okay? And then we have newer generations, OPAS and Los Alamos, okay? which are, uh, it's, they have better atomic physics, still not able to reproduce the experiment. Okay, and so here I'm, I'm comparing just the theoretical uh, results. You can look just at the solid lines. I'm taking as reference OP. Okay, and the, here you have the fractional difference. Uh, okay, well, the, the ratio between the different opacities and OP. Okay, at the base of the convective zone, uh, here at the, at the boundary of the gray shaded area, and towards the solar center on the left at higher temperatures. And you see that overall the, the opacities, the different opacities, agree within 5% of the base of the convective zone and better when you go towards the interior, except for the op-lib, which is the Los Alamos uh, uh, calculation, which are much lower by up to 15%, depending on which comparison you do, uh, than, than the rest. Okay, So that's the state of the art in terms of atomic uh, calculation. Still, the difference at the base of the convective zone is much smaller than what would be required to fix the, the solar abundance problem. Okay, so this will take just a, a summary of what I just uh, mentioned. Okay, now when you put these uh, different opacities into the into the models, this is the type of sound splits you get. There are some variations with respect to, to the OP, which is in red shown here, depends for the high metallicity or the low metallicity, but within each panel. You see that there are, there are some, some variation. But when you look uh, to the overall agreement, nothing uh, is affected very much. And this is summarized here in the, in the table, just the root mean square of the sound speed uh, difference here. And you also find some small differences in the depth of the convective zone and the surface helium above. They are not unmodified, but the changes are moderate. Okay. Overall, the situation doesn't really change. Now, when you look at the frequency ratios, here the situation gets a bit uh, more confused because you see the high metallicity models, which reproduce reasonably well the ratios here for OP uh, and OPAL, they are not reproduced when you use the Los Alamos opacity, the op -lib. On the other hand, when you go to low metallicities, the uh, OP, OPAL, and OPAS in this case, they don't reproduce the ratios. And when you use the Los Alamos, you get a better agreement. So it's a bit strange in the sense that uh, all the so far all the helioseismic results were consistently bad or good, but here the situation changes because we have uh, sound speeds that are not correct for OPLIB, as I showed in the previous uh, slide, but here the ratios are correct. So there is a bit of a mixed information right now. So this coherent picture is, is somehow broken. So depending on which probe you use, which helioseismic probe you use, you get a positive or a negative result. Okay. So that's not very pleasant. 
And when you we look at the solar neutrinos, here again you see that the oblique result in green completely uh, is completely off from the experimental result that you see here in the in the cross. Okay. So the oblique result shows a good core structure when you look at the ratios, but shows very bad solar neutrino production, which is also coming from the solar core. So it's a bit puzzling. Uh, to be honest. So, of course, we know that the reason is that the, the low temperature uh, that you get with OPLIV is not able to give you enough, enough neutrino fluxes. But the question still remains, so why the ratios are uh, coming out okay? Right? And this is uh, where well, the, the, the frequency ratios have been, have been looked by by, by Gael Bulgent, and uh, it's always the same consistent uh, uh, with what I'm just uh, mentioning here. Right? So it seems that the solar neutrinos and frequency ratios might tell us different stories sometimes, right? But depending on the opacities we are using. So that's not so pleasant. Another little piece of incoherence uh, comes uh, from a, a inversion of the solar metallicity done again with the helioseismic data. This uh, done by, by Gael Bulgen and also was initially started with a different technique by, by Boron Soft. 2013. Okay, and here it just, okay, it's a bit of a messy plot, but the, the point you need to focus on are the blue dots that are mostly clustered around 0 0 0.014, 0 0.012 or so in the, in the metallicity. So this inversion of the metallicity in the envelope favor a lower metallicity. Here. So here helioseismology is pointing towards a low metallicity. Now, it's important here to keep in mind that this is insensitive to the opacities you are using. Instead, it's sensitive to the equation of state. Okay. So there is a different dependence, a different dependence here, which is maybe breaking this degeneracy between metallicity and opacity in, in a very interesting way. Okay. And the uh, last part of inconsistency or incoherence, I would say, comes from the oxygen abundances. Okay. So this is just a summary of the a bit of the history of the oxygen abundance determined uh, with spectroscopy. Uh, for oxygen, the most reliable lines that one can use is a, a triplet uh, at uh, 777 nanometers, and then a forbidden line at 600 at, at 630 nanometers. In one case, it's strongly affected, by, or in both cases, affected by an LT, in particular the 630. Uh, nanometer line is also affected by a nickel blend. Okay. And when I write here discrepant, discrepant, or consistent, I mean that you get consistent or discrepant values for oxygen depending on which of the of the lines you are using up here. Okay. But uh, you can see that there has been a kind of a, a systematic uh, offset between this uh, Kafau results and Asplund, and Asplund himself has been consistent through through the years with his uh, final result. Now there is uh, ongoing work by, by, by Maria Bergeman and collaborators on this, trying to do a, a very systematic uh, study of also of the uncertainties and so on. So here what I'm showing is just uh, some material provided by, by Maria. And uh, this is uh, the, the triplet here on the, on the left panels, the forbidden line on the right panel. And what you see in the different rows are uh, different uh, directions. So this is the, the center of the disk, and this is when you go towards the, the limb. Okay, as you can see. And so this is just to illustrate that uh, the best fit here are not consistent one with the other. Okay. And so there is a systematic offset of about 0.1 dex or so, uh, depending on which lines you use. And this new analysis has some uh, improvements with respect to previous ones in terms of the non-LT treatment. So there is extended oxygen uh, atom. There is new atomic data for all the, the processes affecting line formation, particular uh, collisions uh, with uh, hydrogen. Um, there's also a new model for uh, nickel, and nickel is treated here for the first time in NLT. Remember that for the 630 nanometer line, there is this nickel blend, so you need to model this blend very well in order to extract a robust oxygen abundance. And this is also done now again in 3D. There's an improvement in the, the, the 
the solar spectrum that is being used. It's uh, highest resolution is uh, 700,000. There's also inclusion of the effect of the chromosphere because it back hits the, 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 the photosphere. And this introduces changes in the oxygen you derive. And also some systematic study of the impact of the resolution of the 3D. So when you put all this together, uh, this is the, the, the best results you, you get here. So here on, on the top panel, you see the triplet uh, oxygen and below the forbidden line. And the dark uh, uh, shade uh, area is the preferred range. Okay? The different shaded areas depend on uh, how you model the hydrogen collision uh, in both the, the triplet and the forbidden line. Okay. And here again, you see this about 0.1 dex uh, discrepancy or difference between the two, the two lines. And uh, with some preference, as I understand, for the result coming from the, from the, from the uh, forbidden line and not the triplet, which seems to be more, more robust. But the picture is not so so clear, so clear cut, right? So I added here one line uh, to the to the table. Okay. So this is something again to to keep in mind that not everything is settled regarding the, the spectroscopy. Okay. So that's a summary for the incoherent picture. Okay. So the atomic calculations do not really agree with experiments. Okay. Uh, there are some differences that come from the uh, uh, Quasi continuum in particular, which is very critical and not understood why the difference between models and, and experiment. In the case of OPLI or the Los Alamos opacities, uh, I think the interesting thing besides the, the result that gives strange results in a sense, the interesting uh, take home message is that uh, it may happen that uh, you have a for example, opacity tables that uh, will tell you a bit of a different story depending on which type of uh, diagnostics you use, right? Of course, in the sun, we have plenty of data, so we hope that we are able to recognize this, but, but for other stars, it might not be the case, okay? So I will try to, to go a little bit more in, into that, okay? Okay, so then the rest is more or less what I just mentioned, okay? So let me go to the last part of the of the talk. Okay. So I try now to look a little bit as, uh, at the sun as a star, but in, 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 in a sense, okay, it's a, a little bit cheating because I'm just using one solar mass evolutionary tracks that have been calibrated to, to the sun. So I'm following here what something like Christian Sendarga uh, has done already some, some years ago. Uh, okay. And then look, yes, at the, at the comparison of the, of the frequencies. Uh, and the frequency ratios uh, when you vary, in this case, the composition, okay? And this is chi-square, this is computing, uh, uh, comparing the, the, model, the frequency models with the Bison data. So these are low degree modes, the type of modes again you would observe for, uh, in, in other stars, okay? And here you see that uh, function, uh, I'm plotting uh, as a function of the solar, ra the, the radius of the model in sense, here, the radius is changing just because the, the model is evolving so along the main sequence, okay? So the radius here is also a time sequence, if you want, okay? So the frequency ratios here, uh, sorry, the, oh, sorry, this, this should not say frequency ratio, this should say frequency. This is only frequencies, okay? Really have a, a information here about the radius or the mean density in this case, because we know the mass of the sun, this is fixed, okay? So, of course, because we are using calibrated solar models, they are bound to give, or so it's not surprising that the best results are given around one solar radius, because the models are calibrated to provide one solar radius. Of course, when you go to the age, they are also quite consistent. They are not exactly the solar age, which is so, shown here as a, as a dashed line, simply because I was not also very careful in the, in the calibrations and some, some technical details, which are not too relevant, okay? But the frequencies are telling us a story that's related mostly to the radius of the star in this case, that the mass is, is known. But when you look at the ratios, the situation is different because the frequency ratios, since they are focusing on the what's happening in the core, lose information about the radius of the star. And here, when you compare the, the, 
the models and the, and the data, you see that the breastfeed models, depending on the composition you use, which is written here in the, in the, in the legend, okay, you get the breastfeed at different, uh, at different uh, uh, radius. Okay. And then this, of course, transform into different age determinations. So here you have a, a range which is almost 10% of the solar age just by changing the composition and using the ratios and the frequency, okay? And this is, as I said, this is a, a continuation in the sense of what Jorgen has done about 10 years ago, where he, he looked at the small frequency separations and found uh, similar results based on nopal opacities instead of OP, okay? So this is telling us that uh, okay, we should be careful with the composition because it matters for of the ages of the star, which is something we care about with astrosismology. And now we can also look at this regarding the opacity calculations, which are also something we need to uh, choose in our models, okay? And this is the same, now looking at the ratios, okay? And depending on the tables you use, and this is for the same solar composition, again, you have a variation here of about 2% in the radius of the best fit model. When you look at the ages, you get quite a spread, okay? So you go from the lowest age estimate with the Los Alamos opacities, which, as I said, they are a bit strange in terms of what they, they give us for the solar core, okay? And when you look uh, at the opal, uh, the opas and the OP, you have ages which are in excess of the solar age, right? Again, quite, quite a number. So, uh, okay, it's not so, not so clear, right? What, uh, how to how to go about this? Because the, the, the opacities uh, we need to the, the theoretical calculations are, are are the only thing we we have available here. Okay, and this um, it's also difficult to to separate which uh, is better than the other, right? except for the uplift, okay, which I would clearly discard because of the neutrino results, but. Uh, for the rest, it, it has a systematic impact uh, on, on the age determination. On the other hand, the, sol, the, the model frequencies or the frequency ratios tell us some different story about the stars. Okay. If you use, you use frequencies or frequency ratios to, to model uh, a star that you have observed with astroseismology, you will be getting different answers. Okay. And the reason is that uh, when you look at the frequencies, you know we need to correct by the surface uh, effects. So that means the imperfection that we have in our stellar models about the, the, the outer layers of the, of the star. Uh, and so uh, computing frequency ratios from the frequencies in the model will not care about the surface effects, but when we want to compare directly the frequencies in the model with the frequencies in the data, we need to care about this. And this uh, somehow uh, makes these two type of analysis, ratios or directly frequencies, different analysis, which might not be consistent with each other. So in terms of the, of the astroseismic missions, it's really necessary to think how to combine these things because we need both types of information. Uh, because they are complementary and they are not telling us the same, the same story. Okay? This is of course known in a general sense, but at least to, to my knowledge, uh, it has not been really looked into uh, with some detail uh, regarding future uh, astrosismic missions in particular. Okay? So I think this is something to, to care about. Okay, and uh, I would have just continue repeating some uh, more or less the same story with some uh, studies we are starting to, to do within the PLATO collaboration in preparation for, for the PLATO mission, but the bottom line will be more or less the same. Right? Will be that uh, when you look at frequencies, the ages seem to be quite consistent, uh, but maybe this is not really the only thing we should try. We should try really to also to, to look at the ratios as as a way to, to, to understand more better the systematics we may be putting into the model. So these are ages determined for synthetic stars using different opacity tables in the calculation. And you see here highlighted that the ages in, in all cases, maybe except in this one, are very, very similar. Okay. 
So one would feel confident about this, but maybe this is not the right way to do because only frequencies have been compared here, okay. not frequency already. And here is a similar test, but done with using different uh, uh, solar mixtures for calibration, uh, for the calculation of the, of the models. And here you see similar effects to what I showed for, for the sun. You get age differences that at six, nine, eight percent depending on the on the star. Okay. So well I can I can skip this, I can show it if needed, but certainly opacities are very relevant because they will affect the evolutionary time scale of the star. As you know, uh, the, the opacity regulates how easy it is for the star to to radiate its energy. So higher or lower opacities will affect this and therefore the will make the star more or less luminous given you have the same amount of fuel, the lifetime will be extended or, or shortened. So just to finish here, the summary slide. So in general, from the point of view of solar models, there's no satisfactory solution, at least within the standard solar model framework. Of course, there are non-standard models where you can uh, introduce additional physics with some phenomenological approach uh, to, to cure this. So it's possible i don't know how reliable that is but it's something we can discuss about okay the opacity experiments i think this is a very nice result they have really uncovered theoretical problems in theoretical calculations and after the, the iron experiment with the subsequent experiment and so i think this is a very nice uh, uh, possibility for a for a qualitative improvement in the opacity that we have uh, in the case of the sun, the combination of helioseismology and neutrinos really improved the sensitivity to the physics you put in the models, which I think it's also something nice and that has usually been uh, overlooked, maybe because neutrino measurements were not so good in the past, but uh, it's already a decade that we have a very good neutrino measurement for boron 8 and barium 7. Okay. Then my question in general is, uh, which I don't have an answer, uh, are frequency ratios robust? About the inform uh, on the information they give us about core structure. And after looking at the results with the Los Alamos, I'm particular and uh, neutrino, I'm particularly not not so convinced that this is uh, that's a, a very simple a very simple answer. Okay. And again, uh, what I mentioned before, this loss loss of inco of coherence is that uh, different types of heliosigmy probes give us different information now and not necessarily uh, uh, consistent in terms of the the picture we get uh, about the sun right in particular once you break free from the the generosity between composition and opacity you start seeing uh, um, this these different uh, results for example in the case of the inversion of the of the low metallicity uh, abundance in the in the solar envelope by by guy Wood. Okay, and this is very nice because uh, maybe this really reinforces the idea that there, there's really a missing opacity in the models, which, okay, it's bad, but it would be very good to that we are sure about this. Okay. So that would be very nice. And then finally, as a general uh, caveat, but this is something already known uh, by, by many, is that the frequency and the frequency separation don't really tell us the same, the same story. Uh, about, about not necessarily tell us the same story about this time. Right? I think somehow we should find a way of using seismic studies that combine both of them, uh, and of course continue working on the on the surface uh, treatment of the surface corrections to to make a frequency direct comparison of frequencies more more robust. So, and I think I, I will finish here because I'm already a bit late. Thank you uh, for a very interesting talk. It's, we, we cannot hear the applause, but I think many of them are thanking you. And I would like Thank to you. open the floor for uh, discussion. You, you see it actually here. So, um, and the floor is open for discussion. And please, Zabani, uh, you raised your hand. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. And thank you, Aldo. That was a very interesting talk and very nicely co uh, collated. A uh, couple of comments. First, you mm -hmm. mentioned that the frequency and frequency ratios tell a different story. Mm -hmm. So this is shameless advertisement of my students' work. Joel Ong has published a paper last year looking at what happens if you use the different parameters. I mean, ah, okay. frequency ratios. Uh, this is an app J. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the oxygen abundance. There's a paper last year by a group at the in the Canary Islands. So that's mm -hmm. Cubas Armas, Asenio Ramos, and Socas Navarro. They yes, did a yes. resolved, they looked at oxygen abundance at different places on the sun and found different abundances in the granula, granular in the granules versus the intergranule lengths. 8.83 in one case and 8.76 in the other. Yes. So I've mm -hmm. often wondered how the sun as a star spectra would combine this to give an oxygen abundance. Uh, this is something mm -hmm. we might need to. Uh, yeah, yeah totally. think yes, 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 yes. I, I, I'm aware of that uh, paper and, and the numbers. But not of the details, unfortunately. I must confess. It's an so, it's an A and A paper. Two thousand. I, I know I know the paper, but having yeah. the <laughs> having yeah. to, to taking the time to 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 delve into it. Yeah. Okay. But so, yes, yes, but certainly. It, yeah. yeah. So my question was, uh, I'm a curious that didn't you, that you didn't look at the CNO neutrino abundances with respect to yes. Yes. Okay. So, okay. so what do you get thank with you so those? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that's my next slide. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's true. So, okay. So, um, so shortly, right, last year, uh, Borexino published the first detection of CN neutrino. So, CN in the sun is marginal in terms of energetics, it's about 1%, uh, which is, uh, of course, makes it difficult for detection. But on the other hand, it's very nice that it's marginal uh, in in the way, in the sense that it gives us a more powerful diagnostic tool. Okay, because the fact that it's marginal means that the conditions in the solar core are not do not depend on the CN cycle, but only on the PP. Okay, that means that any variation you introduce. For example, in the nuclear reaction rates that affect the CN cycle or the CN abundances, will reflect directly on the fluxes because they will not have a feedback on the conditions in the solar in the solar core. Okay, if you would go to massive stars, this would not be the case. You can duplicate the the, the reaction rates, and the nuclear energy generation will be affected very marginally, just because the the star will compensate for for this change. Okay, but here in the sun is not. And so that, in particular, if you see here the CNO cycle, but here we focus on the CN part, so on the first uh, loop here, that gives us a linear dependence on the CN neutrino flux on the carbon plus nitrogen abundance in the core. And you can relate this uh, uh, with a hypothetical measurement of a CN uh, neutrino flux and uh, a boron age neutrino flux measurement, which we already have as I shown uh, to a very good precision. So you can play a little bit with the models and so on and so forth, and you end up with some relation where you can extract the C plus N that you see here, which is the carbon nitrogen abundance in the core, provided you have a measurement of the neutrino flux for the boron eight and for the, in this case, oxygen 15, but the CN, any CN flux. And this is very nice because this provided some experimental uncertainty, would provide you with the core carbon nitrogen abundance within a 10% uh, uncertainty, which is dominated by nuclear reaction rate uncertainty. So this is very nice. So Borexino last year were able, you know, the, the collaboration was able to, to measure CNO fluxes. This is the complete Borexino spectrum that you see there in, in black. Okay, And the CN, measure, CN measurement comes here. You can see it's very, uh, under other fluxes like the PEP flux or background here like the Bismuth 210. Okay, so it was uh, 20 years uh, to be able to to get this measurement. Okay, 
but so far this is the, the result we have right so, so let me show you so the blue line here is the low metallicity model prediction for the cn flag the, the purple is the high metallicity prediction this is all to one sigma and in gray okay this is the borexino result so okay you see that the error bars are still very large okay so it's difficult or it's, it's not possible let's say at the moment to draw any uh, conclusion on the on the cn abundances and this is all just one sigma okay so that's why sarvani i didn't mention this uh, here uh, uh, at the moment right so the achievement is amazing at the moment in terms of the solar composition this is still premature i know unofficially let's say that they have improved this already uh, by some fraction okay and they are at least now able to uh, to a reasonable amount of sigmas uh, to say something uh, but uh, okay this is ongoing work so i cannot <laughs> advance more than that mm -hmm. But of course, this is very nice because this is another way of breaking the degeneracy between CN and composition and, and opacity. Indeed, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. The next question is from Chris Fontes. I would just like, just before you start, I would like to encourage everybody, especially the students in the, audit, uh, in the audience to come up with questions. Please raise your hand so uh, we know you want to make a contribution. Uh, Chris, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Aldo. Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm from Los Alamos. So I work on the op libel opacities. Uh, can mm -hmm. you can you uh, iterate or reiterate what for the neutrino discrepancy? What set of conditions is this neutrino comparison highlighting compared to the conditions yes. at the base yes. of the source? It's basically that the that the the core temperature is too low. So the opacity, the Los Alamos opacities, what we find is that they are too low in the core in this regard. So here, right? So here you can see better. So, so this 15% in the core, uh, lower opacity, okay? This, I, I, I mentioned this to, 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 okay, sorry, I forgot the first name, but to Colgan, right? So I mentioned this to him uh, by email uh, some time ago. So the, we find this to be too low in the core. Okay, so the temp, the, the opacity. So therefore, the temperature is too low. Uh, too low means here uh, one percent maybe, but the boron eight is sensitive to temperature to the twenty twenty fifth power, right? So it propagates a, a lot, right? Uh, yeah. So that's basically the. The, the point okay. here. That's, that's interesting yeah. because as you go to higher temperature, typically the atomic models tend to agree. So uh, I will talk to James Colgan. And yes, yes, yeah. I would be very interesting because on the other hand, the the the, the nice thing, let's say, about the, the Los Alamos opacities is that because it's so low in the in the core, it has a larger, uh, a steeper uh, gradient when you go outwards. And this helps with the sound speed profile, because the sound yeah. speed profile doesn't require an overall scaling, but requires a, a tilted correction. Slope, and right? Yeah. So, so which <laughs> can which, achieve uh, both, of, maybe? Which set of mixtures is this for? AGSS or? So, so the solid line here, uh, I think it's Greves uh, ninety-eight. And the dotted line is Aston. So it's basically both, you see, more or less is the same. Okay. Yeah. Grazie mille. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> so the next, uh, thank you. The next question is from Desmond. Please go ahead. Hello, Desmond here from Graz. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. thank, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have a more general question because you talked about the solar modeling modeling problem or solar abundance problem mm -hmm. <laughs> from which side view you it what would you say uh, what, what is your opinion on that matter is this more a solar modeling problem or is this more a solar abundance problem 
or what do you think is the the biggest sub problem in issue getting the model up on the right side with the data if you understand what i mean so what, I, I, what's I the think, biggest I, step yeah I, I, I think so. yeah well i think there are two uh, so okay so first let me mention clearly the standard solar models have their their own intrinsic limitations in the sense that the physics included in them is incomplete that's clear right so there's no modeling of taco climb there's no rotation uh the, the way the transition at the taco climb is modeled is uh, very poor and so there are many let's say we call non-standard physics that we know should be there right and there are many non-standard solar models circulating around okay so that one thing but that will so far at least that doesn't seem to be the solution for the global uh, for example it sounds with the discrepancy that you see here, right so so whatever would fix in that respect the solar models should and the standard solar models should also work uh, similar level for the non standard so that's it now in terms i think it's really uh, okay so um, maybe it's a bit of a biased view mine of course but I think the, uh, the the situation here is that uh, it's half and half regarding the, the, the oxygen abundance in particular, and the and the opacities too. Right? Uh, so okay, and it's a kind of a Salomonic answer I'm giving, right? <laughs> uh, but I think uh, the, the the new work on on oxygen I think will be will be very very relevant in this regard and. Uh, also in regard uh, in relation to this what what Sarvani was mentioning uh, regarding this other uh, approach for determination of oxygen as well right? uh, but i don't think any uh, i mean the, the old oxygen values okay, maybe in this uh, other work uh, they recovered this but uh, that seemed a bit out of the of the question mm -hmm. And the opacities are clearly showing a problem, right? That's also clear. And all the problems that are seen in the opacities go in the direction of current atomic calculations underestimating the opacity. So that's also something there. So what, uh, what I hope is that uh, these this, uh, results on, on, on the experimental opacities, in particular after the 2019 follow-up paper with chromium and, and and nickel that are giving a much clearer picture that there are problems there that are not just related to some flood measurement with iron that would really trigger people doing uh, opacity calculations to to to, to change this to, to to work on this again right uh, knowing in which direction they may be missing something so i think that uh, that will be good and not just for solar models but uh, for stellar in general right uh, so those those are the two the two things. Mm. On the other hand, for example, the CNO, right? So, okay, uh, opacities in the stellar solar interior are not sensitive to carbon nitrogen, right? So, okay, maybe in the future we have a new neutrino experiments, or not specifically devoted to neutrinos, but there are dark matter experiments that have in their uh, science cases doing solar neutrinos and in particular CNO uh, that will also shed some light but that's a long term uh, future right? uh, talking about the comparison you mentioned that the lines you get from the experiment are narrower yeah. than no uh, the, the, the theoretical, lines theoretical. Are narrower. what yes. would what would that point to is there any candidate mechanism that could be pinpointed or I, 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 that's out of my expertise, okay. so I cannot, um, yeah, that's something I cannot answer, yes. This is Chris Vance, made a comment. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. So I don't know if Thomas Gomez is still here. I saw him on the list. Uh, he's an expert in line broadening theory, and he's done some very interesting work for simpler systems, not, uh, you know, crazy iron with lots of bound electrons. And he's found some fundamental flaws in, in very basic theory that has been used for many decades. So if we can apply his approach 
to these types of opacities, we may see the theoretical lines broaden more and give better agreement, which is good news. On the, yeah. on the other side, um, the, the 2019 PRL by Nagiyama does not show the difference in the quasi-continuum for chromium and nickel that is shown in iron, and that is very perplexing for theorists. Because yes. that kind of the theory for that is fairly straightforward. We have some rules, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't know how many people in this community know about it, but it's a very perplexing thing. The theorists have been working on it now for more than a decade. Um, the Los Alamos Oplife stuff has lines that are much more detailed than we've ever done before. So we're working on it, but it's not easy to come up with answers, yeah. particularly yeah. for the quasi continuum. Yeah, well, they, they leave the, the, the question open in that in Nagayama's paper, right? That there may be something with the experiment with iron, right? At high temperature, because also the iron experiment, they did, in fact, I didn't show, but they, they did that for different conditions, right? And when they go to low temperature, below 180 electron volts, they don't see this quasi continuum difference, right? Correct. So, yeah, so even that is by itself a bit perplexing, right? Highly, yeah, from the theoretical yeah. point of view, why is iron different at the yeah. higher temperature, yeah. but not at the higher temperature. temperatures? That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This one is your uh, question answered. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. What a so, very good, very long answer to my question. I have a clearer picture now. So, uh, next question, next hand raised is Marcelo. Hi. Hi, hello. Thank you very Hi, much for the, for the presentation. It was, as always, perfect and also very interesting. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I have a question which is a completely different point of view, which is, of course, as I do stellar models. I'd like to know your opinion of what would you recommend to people doing stellar models? I mean, nowadays people are constructing a lot of grids, you know, in order to model populations. Yeah. So what would be your recommendation for people, let's say, computing these grids in terms of what uh, metal metallicities and abundance is to use for the stellar models. I mean, I have my own opinion, but I would like to know yours and yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I am mostly related to, to astro seismic work lately, right? And in this regard, I like to get the sun right. <laughs> so uh, my basic uh, choice is uh, still the old metallicity and the the current atomic uh, opacity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's it. No. Mm -hmm. So thanks. So, are there further questions? If you if you don't have a microphone, you also can type in the chat. Um, in the meantime. In the meantime, I just would like to ask, so you were talking about the scatter on the age. Mm. Um, how much is, uh, how many modes uh, did you use on the seismic, uh, uh, use on the seismic modeling there? And you if you compare for the, that, for the sim, for, sorry, for the mass radius and age, how many modes were yeah. used for the solar models? Yeah, and yeah. If you so, go to the stars, you have less modes. Yes. So for for this for the sun, what I, I I done is just to use Bison data. So from L equal zero to three, and I think I use sixteen modes for each uh, L. So that's about sixteen modes or so. Okay. For the synthetic stars, the Plato ex, uh, exercise, I think we have typically between twenty five to thirty five modes or something like that because there's no L equals three modes. So there are not no octopole modes there, and if, uh, a bit of a narrower range also on the on the other uh, angular degrees, because there are also different uh, new maxes and so on, right? So, but of the order of thirty or something like that, right? so thirty something, yeah, more or less. But uh, yeah. And uh, how does this pop? If you so. Um... Can you uh, can you say that using different opacities give it a certain tendency in the age determination? So do we over or underestimate the age? Well, 
Yes. In so in, in the in the tests we have done, in yeah. fact, there's almost no difference. Right? I think there's only one star for which there is a few percent. The others there's almost no difference. So uh, one could say there's no bias apparently. But again, since we have tried only with the frequencies here, and you know the frequencies, since you need to correct for surface effects, this doesn't necessarily mean that the frequency ratios we are getting with OP or OPAL are the same. Okay, so this we have not looked at, but I think we, we need to look at this. Too. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I think it's a, in, yeah, it's too, too soon to, to tell, let's say. Uh, okay. With this. Too soon to call. Okay, so thank you. I see we are already well advanced. If there is, I just give a last chance if anybody wants to make a comment or a statement or a question. If not, I would like to thank Aldo again for giving a very interesting talk. I'm happy it's recorded so I can go back and listen to, to, some, uh, to all of it and to some parts. And as I say, this was just a substitute for the actual call. I hope that when the world stopped spinning as fast as it does right now, um, that there's a chance that you come to Graz to give one of the presentations and that definitely will be then in winter so that we can go skiing. <laughs> um, thank you everybody okay. for coming. It was a very international group today. Good to see uh, many of you and I hope to see everybody um, at a conference somewhere near and soon. Okay. So thank you, Paul, and thanks everybody for spending one and a half hours here. Uh, so. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.